Hello everyone, happy Tuesday. My name is Casey Marshall and I am the Partner Marketing Specialist here at Greenhouse. I'm so happy to welcome you all to this Hiring Hacks webinar. And in today's webinar, Steve Wood, Technical Recruiter at Squarespace, will share how to actively engage and source engineers. As most recruiters know, LinkedIn is no longer an effective source for engaging engineering talent. Engineers are getting handfuls of messages a day from recruiters. Are you one of them? Trying to make that first interaction and sell them on a specific role. However, you can't just depend on one platform to do all the work. In order to make yourself stand out, you have to utilize other resources and techniques. So, what are those techniques that will make engineers interested in learning more about you and your company? In this webinar, Steve will deep dive into the strategies and tools that will help you step up your sourcing recruiting game. But before we dive into the presentation, I just want to take a few minutes to go over some housekeeping items. If you're new to On24, uh, there is a little thing called a widget at the bottom of the screen. These are resources that you'll be able to get handfuls of information and best practices from Hacker Inc. and Greenhouse. We'll also be uh, sending the on-demand viewing for you and your team or anyone that might have missed the webinar tomorrow. Please feel free to ask questions as we go through the webinar. There is a Q&A box on the right-hand side of the slide window, and if you don't see it, just select Q&A button on the widget tray and it will maximize. We'll be taking time at the end to go through questions and have plenty of time to pick Steve's brain. Any issues for me, just chat and, uh, on the Q&A window. Without further ado, let's get started. So today's moderators, myself, as I uh, already introduced myself, I'm Casey Marshall, and we have Lauren from Hacker Inc. So what is Hiring Hacks? Hiring Hacks is a series presented by Greenhouse, and for those of you who might not know, Greenhouse is an end-to-end -end recruiting optimization platform helping companies get better at recruiting. In this Hiring Hack series, each webinar focuses on strategy, strategies and tools that help measurably improve the recruiting process and outcomes. We've partnered with HackRank to discuss how Squarespace writes sourcing messages that attract engineers, their best practices and channels to leverage when sleuthing the web, and how to use data to optimize your sourcing processes to get better and faster each time. And I'll leave it off to Lauren, who will share a little bit of insight into what Hacker Inc. is. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Lauren from Hacker Inc. <clears throat> I will walk you, uh, provide you a quick overview of Hacker Inc. So if Steve mentions us, you have an idea of what we offer. Hacker Inc. supports your end-to-end -end technical hiring needs by focusing on three key areas of your recruiting process. Sourcing, screening, and interviewing. At the top of the funnel, you can source passionate developers with code sprints. <clears throat> code sprints are online hackathons where thousands of developers solve code challenges and are ranked by how well they can code. At the end of the competition, you, the recruiter, receive a stack ranked list of all developers who competed, including their contact information, rank, and score. Code sprints are a great way to fill your sourcing funnel with passionate pre-qualified engineers. Then, screen technical candidates with engaging auto-score code challenges. Code challenges are word problems developers solve that evaluate how well a developer can code based on the speed and accuracy of their code. You, the recruiter, can work with your engineering team to develop engaging code challenges that best reflect the skill set required for a particular role you are looking to fill. So once you identify a candidate, invite them to solve a code challenge, and they complete the code challenge, you will receive an auto-scored report reflecting the candidate's performance. Code challenges are a great way to pre-qualify candidate skill set required for a particular role. And once you have identified pre-qualified standout programmers from a screening process, interview them with CodePair. CodePair is a paired programming tool that combines live video chat with a live coding environment. You can basically have your candidate solve code challenges with you live via video so you can get a good 360 review of not only their programming aptitude, but also their personality. 
could this candidate be a good culture fit into your organization, and do they have the skill set you're looking for? So at the end of the day, what does HackRank work? There are four key reasons to why HackRank works. <clears throat> One, HackRank empowers you to keep the top of your funnel consistently filled with fresh, passionate talent from our HackerRank community. We have a community of over 1 million developers who come to our site on their own time to solve code challenges to hone their coding skills and compete in code competitions for fun. This is the ultimate community to source from, and we have a number of different ways you can source engineers directly from our community. These keeps your, your funnel fresh, and it keeps your funnel filled. Two, recruit candidates who may not be an obvious fit based off their resume. Resumes, GPAs, and pedigree tell only part of the story. When hiring programmers, go beyond the resume and get insights into their true coding skills with code challenges. And enhance your recruiting process by ensuring your engineering teams are speaking to qualified candidates. I'm sure as recruiters, you've all heard it before. Your engineering team says a candidate was invited for an on-site interview who probably should not have passed the pre-screening process. Code challenges help you vet out who is qualified and ultimately save you and your engineering team a lot of time so they can focus on more time coding and less time interviewing. So this all leads to an improved end-to-end -end technical recruiting process. It reduces your time to hire. It improves your on-site to offer ratio. It saves you your time, it saves your engineering team's time, and at the end of the day, it saves you a lot of money. These are the four ways HackRank can have a strong impact on your technical recruiting process. And with that, I'm going to pass this over to our awesome speaker, Steve. Steve is a technical recruiter from Squarespace, and he will discuss his sourcing tips and tricks. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Casey. Um, so, I'm going to talk about a few things today. Um, go over to the next slide. We're going to start with candidate discovery and sourcing. So we all have different channels that we go to pretty often to find engineers, developers, any technical talent. So I'm going to explore a few alternative ones, some creative ones, and uh, they might work for you, they might not work for you, but um, the end goal here is is to think of sourcing and discovery differently. Um, so I'll go through a number of examples there and messaging and reach out. So through sourcing and discovery, um, you should gain some interesting um, perspectives from these leads on how to engage them, and I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, another topic that I don't think is really brought up enough in technical recruiting is doing and conducting a better phone screen. So um, a lot of the times we're the first point of contact when it comes to engaging engineers. So um, in my opinion, that's one of the most important steps. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of questions I like to ask candidates and also um, what I like to share with them. So there's that. Um, there's tools, different tools I use um, for sourcing and recruiting. Some of these aren't exactly new tools or revolutionary tools, but I just thought I'd share um, kind of what I use there. And then we'll wrap up with Q&A. So what I'm going to start with here, um, as far as sourcing goes, is two tools. Um, one is IRC and one is Slack. So IRC has been, been around a long time. Um, it's a communication and chat tool. It's It's been around way before Slack, way before um, Facebook Messenger, HipChat, um, it's kind of, um, it evolved out of message boards and forms from um, from developers and academia. Um, and there's a number of different um, channels and uh, avenues you can, you can go down. It has a very large Linux community and programming language community. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk a little bit about Slack. And for those who aren't familiar with Slack, um, it's an internal tool for chat and team coll collaboration, um, primarily used within companies. But um, recently, there's been um, big external com com communities around Slack. And 
Um, they range from WordPress, JavaScript. There's even ones to do with um, women in tech and um, design as well. So it's an interesting um, pool of candidates. Um, so for the first one, I'll be talking about Slack. So this is a screenshot or a GIF of a Slack chat room. Um, and this particular one is Ember.js. So on the left-hand side, you'll see different channels associated with the chat room. Some are about announcements to do with the framework. Some are general conversations. Um, and if you see on the right, there's an animation of me going through a team directory. So the team directory is interesting because it'll show usernames, photos, sometimes full names. And in this case, if you see this candidate, I'm clicking Aaron. It'll have um, his time zone, his email address, um, his title. Um, and in my opinion, when, when developers and engineers are actively chatting and engaging with the community um, on like a Slack, it's a pretty good sign that they're fairly capable, they're passionate about what they do, um, and it's something they're really, really interested in, especially if they're helping the, com the community. Then, um, at least at Squarespace, that's a really good culture fit for us because it shows that they're open to mentoring and helping, and they're also good at what they do. So um, that's Slack. And um, if you Google around, you can find different Slack rooms to do with a number of things. Some of these you have to request membership. Um, some of them you have to pay for to join um, because they, the people who run these communities have to pay Slack, I, I believe, to use them. Um, and I would avoid messaging people on here as a recruiter. Um, it's an easy way to get banned and blacklisted, but um, it's easy enough to find these people's information through Google searching their name. You have their email address. You can reverse image search their, their pictures. So um, there's a lot of useful data points here. Um, the next one is IRC. Um, IRC, the user interface isn't as clean and pretty as a Slack, but um, it's kind of um, reminiscent of uh, a, a much older time in the internet. Um, so if you look on the right side, um, I'm in a Python room right now. So if you see up top, Freenode is one of the networks that hosts IRC. Um, but on the right, you'll see a bunch of um, usernames. And if you click one, um, there's a little option for who is. So if you look there, um, who is will pull up their name, their IP address, and it also kind of show where they're coming from. Um, and in this case, it pulled up this gentleman's first name and last name. So um, if you Google that name, you'll find that they're actually an engineer at Yahoo here in the US. So um, that was a lead that I might not have found otherwise because um, I kind of explored it starting with IRC. So um, again, these tools, I don't expect um, recruiters to hire 100% of their headcount from using IRC or Slack, but it's an interesting way to start off a search or find people who are particularly interested in a certain programming topic. Um, they also make really good um, like developer ev evangelists and advocates if your company hires people like that because they're involved in the, com the community, they probably know a lot of, a lot of uh, developers as well. Um, so it's an interesting avenue to explore. Um, the next one um, I find really interesting. So if everyone here isn't familiar with Goodreads, it's a site for readers to um, review books, make recommendations, build lists. They can have friends. You can, um, the authors are also involved. Um, and programmers like reading books. And um, in this case, this book I have showcased here is about JavaScript. And this is considered like the JavaScript Bible. Um, people read it. It's kind of w one of those books that are, is suggested for new newcomers to, to JavaScript. So um, people have a lot of opinions on it, good and bad. Um, and you can see here how many reviews there are, ratings, um, people who read this, also enjoyed this. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, here are three comments from that book. So right off the bat, we have full names, pictures, and some good content around how they think and um, what, what, what they like. So 
personally, again, this kind of goes back to Slack and IRC. Um, I think that programmers who have opinions and um, who write about it in their free time and who are passionate about it kind of already pass the cultural bar here at Squarespace for the most part, um, as opposed to if we went on LinkedIn and we searched people. Um, it's harder to tell because they might be trying to maintain a professional a professional appearance or they're maybe a bit more reserved because it's it's more looked at as a professional uh, networking site. Um, so I took the liberty of just kind of putting the three profiles here and um, these look to be pretty good engineers if you look them up on LinkedIn. Um, they work at good companies and have um, also like open source portfolios and um, opinions on here. And this is also an interesting way to engage um, some engineers. I've I've done it several times and I found that um, they really appreciate when you take the effort to understand them and know and know what they like. And they actually find it pretty cool if you're like, oh, I found you on if you, I found you on Goodreads, and that's something you can even put in a subject line um, that it definitely gets them to open it and at least respond, even if um, they're not they're not interested. Um, this next slide is um, what a profile looks like. So if you click one of those comments, in this case, I picked this. This guy who wrote a review on the book, you have um, um, personal a personal website, a location, a photo, friends, and usually programmers are friends with other programmers, um, things they like. Um, so if you read a book they've liked or read, or they there's also a list to read. So maybe they want to read a certain book and they put that on a list and you've already read it. That's a great way to build up a rapport. Um, and this engineer works for Discus. So, um, so far out of the four profiles I've pulled, they all work for pretty strong companies. Um, and yes, they are kind of ge geographically um, distributed, but um, if, if you work for a mid-sized tech company, um, especially if these candidates are living in big cities, in my opinion um, and experience, they have um, are usually more open to relocation than um, people who maybe live in a smaller city or somewhere not as populated. Um, another avenue is Amazon.com, very similar approach. You go to, you search programming books um, and look at the authors, um, and then you see who writes comments, and here are two cases where we have full names and um, some background and how they think, um, stuff like that. Um, next one Next avenue uh, that I find interesting to source from, oops, sorry, I skipped the slide. So YouTube and Vimeo. Um, also interesting ways to find candidates. So um, people go to a lot of conferences, give talks, webinars, um, tutorials, um, you name it, and they like to put them up on, on YouTube for others to learn and um, gain experience from. So in this case, on the left, I have YouTube, um, and I just searched React JavaScript SF and React the JavaScript framework, and I put in the location, and you see right off the bat we have several names um, of, of talks that occurred in San Francisco. Um, and, and from there, you can go through the comments to see who actually, um, a, lot, a lot of times people will, will write something like, great talk, or um, they might actually have a um, an argument about something they said. So um, I find that an interesting way to find people. Vimeo is the same idea, except Vimeo doesn't have as many videos. So Vimeo does have the ability to um, sort and organize um, likes. So if you've been on YouTube, which I'm sure most of you have, and there's the thumbs up and thumbs down button, and there's a number on each one of those, you can't see who liked it um, or disliked it. But with Vimeo, you can actually sort who liked it. Um, so if it's a video about JavaScript in New York City, there's a good chance that there's people there from New York City. Um, and I know there's a lot of popular programming com communities in smaller cities and um, stuff like that. So it's a great way to kind of find people who are interested in um, programming and 
uh, more so than just the job, and also who um, are central to a certain location. Um, YouTube also is connected to Google+, so um, you can find their Google Plus account through the usernames. So the next one is, I'm sure it's kind of still tied to video. I'm sure you've all seen these culture videos that many companies do. Um, I just grabbed a screenshot of a few of them um, where they talk about their, their values, um, their engineering culture, why they love to work there. Um, I think they're great. Um, they're also, oh, it didn't work, sorry, let me go back. So what I had there was, I, I actually go into the videos and um, I pause the video when a name is brought up and they'll interview different engineers um, and their full names are there or Often it's just the first name and their title, but um, these companies are small, so there can't be more than two or three people with the same name most of the time. So it's um, a great way to um, find people who um, work there and who are actually engaged with the culture. Um, they don't really bring out the people who maybe not be who aren't very happy. So um, it's, in my opinion, kind of an interesting way to find people and, and it, it, it's, it, you can easily reference, hey, I saw you in a, a video about HubSpot. Um, looks like you enjoy working there, but we'd be open to discussing um, different opportunities. Um, so that's just one more avenue when it comes to video. Um, this next slide um, is an interesting way I've came up with sourcing from Indeed. So in this case, um, let's say you were looking for a developer with these skills um, and a location. Um, so this is useful for niche skill sets or if you're sourcing for a particular technology and it's rare, um, I use this to reverse search um, where people work. So in this case, um, Udemy it has the same stack as I put in search. So if I go to the um, their team page, I've found um, different people who work there who likely have the same set of skills. So this is a great way to um, build lists of target companies that have a particular skill set. Um, and if you have a very common uh, stack or list of technologies you use, it might not be as useful. But something else I thought of was, um, in this case, um, I searched C Sharp in San Francisco and New York. So San Francisco has many, the Bay Area has many more engineers than in New York. But in this case, there's a lot of, a lot more jobs for C-sharp in New York. And that that's primarily because of one reason, and that's the financial services industry has um, a loyalty to C-sharp. It's a very resilient stack, and it's, it's something they use a lot for trading, like tr uh, trading systems and um, different front office tools. So if you were beginning a search for C-sharp developers, you might have more luck starting in New York for San Francisco. Um, so you can, use, you can use Indeed and any other job search engine for that same um, kind of tactic as well. So the next one I have, um, it's Instagram. So um, you can only do this on your phone, which is kind of annoying, but what what you can do is you can see where people took pictures. And in this case, I went to Slack in San Francisco, and there's posts. So if people are taking pictures there for like a company party, or they're just it's a it's a normal day at work, where a lot of times you'll find like people getting office tours. Um, we'll be at these. Um, we'll be tagging the company or location in their photos. Um, in this case, I found. This person um, took a picture of a cactus, and the next slide, I clicked them, and um, he has a website, a full name, and if you look up there, he has a username, and this is, and I searched his, I searched him on LinkedIn, and there's a, a developer from Slack, um, and if you look at this, I took his username, and I put it into a tool called Reportive, which I'll talk about later, which um, 
make sure the email is tied to the individual. So in this case, um, Ahmed, um, his email is his Instagram handle. And um, I verified it using Reportive. So I just composed a new email in Gmail, and I put that in there. I just tested it, and it worked. Um, so just like that, I went to Instagram, looked up Slack. It was like the third or fourth picture. I found somebody, and I had their full name, their LinkedIn, their website, their email address, um, all from that. And if you were feeling even more ambitious, you can go through their followers to see if there's other engineers there. You can bookmark them and come back later. Um, that's also a great tactic because you can definitely go down some rabbit holes when using these um, alternative sourcing techniques. Um, that's Instagram. Another one that I'm not going to spend too much time on is Quora. So Quora is great. Um, there's a lot of um, good information out there. You could separate questions by subject. In this case, I took JavaScript. Um, and people can follow subjects, as I'm sure many of you follow recruiting. And there's names here. Um, they have profiles. And in this case, um, here's somebody I found who has a, um, a website. They're an author of a book, a LinkedIn profile, a WordPress blog, um, a picture too. So there's a bunch of things to reference right there. Maybe you can backtrack from there, go to the person's um, um, core answers, see what they've said about things. A lot of times engineers will comment about recruiting um, and interview processes. So um, it's a good way to build rapport as opposed to, again, blindly sourcing LinkedIn. Um, the next slide um, is about Reddit. So if you're not familiar with Reddit, it's a community of sub-interests. So programming is one. There's one about news. There's tons about cats and stuff like that, too. Um, but the programming communities are very active. Um, and one of the most active ones is our programming. So um, here's a bunch of posts about all different types of stuff. Um, a lot of the times it's comparing technologies or um, about engineering culture or product development. Um, and personally, it's a great way for recruiters and sourcers to stay up to date on the industry. So in addition to sourcing from these tools, you learn a lot by forcing yourself to, because um, if you click one of these articles and the article is written by an engineer, um, you should probably, if you're going to reach out to them, you should probably know what they wrote about or at least try to. Or, and it's also a great way to ping your engineers and be like, hey, I read this article. This person looks good. What do you think? What's a good, what's a good approach at engaging them? Um, so that's the reason that I like it. Um, and... What I did here was I went into one of the posts, and it was about a data structure, and this was the top comment on the thread. And there's a username there, John W188. Um, so I took, I just took that name, I Google searched it, and the first four results are a Reddit profile, that's the one we're looking at, a GitHub, and um, a Twitter account that shows where they work and where they work. So. Um, could I have found John elsewhere? Probably, but um, this is just a more, uh, it's like a backwards approach to finding somebody outside of LinkedIn. And um, maybe you start on LinkedIn and you find these people and then you source the opposite way. Um, it's just kind of an example of how you can find people from a number of different um, websites and, and tools. Um, oops. So the next one is Twitter. Um, there's a million ways to source Twitter, but I'm just going to focus on a few that are probably done less often. Um, one is looking at programming frameworks, tools, companies. In this case, React is a popular JavaScript framework. Um, they tweeted out an update, and there's, if you see here, there's 82 retweets and 48 likes, and there's a bunch of pictures next to them. If you click retweets, you'll see a bunch of full names, where they work, and from there it's um, fairly straightforward to find out who they are, where they're located. A lot of them will even have um, links to personal sites, GitHubs, that kind of thing. Um, and you can reference something in their on their Twitter profile, or if they're following React, it's probably a good sign that they use it or are interested in using it. And if your company is using it, then it's a great way to um, to 
uh, have something relevant to speak about as opposed to just, you look great for my company. Um, another one that I've been experimenting with is programming conferences. So um, another good sign is when developers go to conferences that it shows they're interested in their profession outside of work. It's not just a job to them. They're trying to learn. And in this case, um, if people want to speak, give to give uh, tutorials or present something, um, in my opinion, that's another kind of good um, indicator that they're a great engineer um, or at least um, worthy of being reached out to in the first place. Um, and you can do the same thing here. Just go through retweets and likes. Um, and this ties back to video. So I know a lot of this seems random, like why would you start a search on um, Twitter? Why would you start a search on YouTube or Reddit? Um, I found with this type of sourcing, it always goes back to one of these, uh, to one of these areas. And in this case, um, there's a link there to all the speakers of last year. And if you see here, right off the bat, there's 15 names. And this is something where if I was sourcing for uh, a particular role or team, I might bookmark this and come back later. Um, and I'm a big power user of Instapaper. So with Instapaper, it's a tool that I'll talk about a bit more later that you can save articles and links really quickly. So I might just save this quick and um, then when I'm done exploring and sourcing through my other, um, my other tactic, I might come back to this uh, later. And if I go to one of these people and I find their Twitters or personal sites, I might find 10 more leads. So it's easy to get distracted and waste time. So that's why a more structured approach of bookmarking things and um, saving it for later um, helps you manage your time better. Um, another one is Hacker News. Um, so Hacker News, oops, sorry. Hacker News is similar to Reddit in that people post um, links about industry news, um, engineering culture. It's a bit more open when it comes to content and user information. So um, in this case, this user posted an article um, about a programming topic and I hit their username um, and they give their full name there. Um, what they've done, so that's something that I could use to search them on LinkedIn. Um, and a lot of the times, it'll be more like Reddit, where these people who post will have a username that doesn't have anything to do with their name. So if you search that in in Google, there's a good chance that um, you'll find them somewhere else, and their name might be attached. Or you can go back into Reportive and see if like kbongard at gmail.com comes up with a profile. So um, just another way of generating leads. Uh, another part of Hacker News is, I'm sure some of you here participate in this, but once a month they have a, a thread about um, who is hiring. So developers can go here, they can look for jobs, hiring, uh, hiring managers, recruiters can post, um, and it kind of shows what they're looking for, where they're located, how much funding they've raised, um, but I also like to use this for a uh, sourcing tactic. Um, a lot of these are young startups that might um, be failing or bootstrapped. So what I'll do is I'll just I'll hit um, Command F, New York City, and I'll, and I'll go down the list and see which of these companies I don't recognize that are located in New York City. And I might look up their um, company website, um, see if there's a team page, or I might just put them into, uh, into LinkedIn. And you can see their stack here. Um, so it's just a good way to, one, you can post your company here. I've done it before and I've gotten a lot of uh, success from it. Um, and you can source from the list of people. Um, so another way if you're looking for Android developers and iOS developers is the Google Play Store is where um, Android developers um, post, their, uh, post their apps, sell their apps, and I just took one that I like a lot, um, Push Bullet. So it's highly rated. There's a lot of a lot of people who've downloaded it. It's a top developer app, um, so, so it's probably pretty good and it's well engineered. Um, so I just put into LinkedIn Push Bullet Android, and um, this person just left, but um, they look pretty good. And that's just from going through like top rated apps. 
Um, that's, an, that's one more way. And I, I didn't put together one for the App Store, but the same methodology applies there. Find um, interesting apps, good apps. It, it's harder to, to find the people who work on, for example, the very um, like large apps like Facebook, Amazon apps, because um, there's huge teams. So um, another good thing you can do is research um, like like top apps of uh, November t uh, t like 2015 and see if there's smaller apps there that um, are highly rated. Um, and then um, there's probably a better chance of finding out who they are through these searches because they're smaller teams. So another way is the Chrome Store. Um, in this case, there's this Chrome extension from Shia LaBeouf, and if you press it, he, he says, do it. And it's supposed to be for mo for motivation. And it's not a really uh, serious app. It's kind of um, like a toy. But um, people and developers do this in their free time when trying to build up a, port a portfolio. And it's usually a good indication that they're doing things like this in their free time, even if it's um, as silly as this. So in this case, um, if you see under where it says do it, there's who created it. Um, and I just searched that name, and I found the first three links are all tied to who this person is. And this is one of those things where you can easily reference, I downloaded this, I use this, it's cool. We're in the same city, and my company is looking for people like you. What do you want to talk? Um, and most of the time, they get back to you, at least with um, thanks, but not right now. So another one is engineering blocks. So um, it's a big thing now that companies have a presence on their website where they can talk about different engineering problems they've solved um, and walkthroughs on certain um, like integrations, migrations, stuff like that. This is Airbnb's post about looking at Node, and um, just from there, I have his name and his um, his LinkedIn, and it's usually a good sign again when engineers are doing things like this. Um, and there's also comments, so there's 15 comments on this post about Node, and a lot of times people will sign up with their full name, and you could search those names and also find profiles. So um, in this case, you have some ammunition for um, the tool they use and. In this case, um, Jacob is looking to use Chaplin JS, and he's on Freenode, and Freenode is what I mentioned before with IRC. So it all kind of ties back. Um, so it's just depending on where you start, but um, this gives you like a good picture of what the candidates like. Uh, my next one uh, is GitHub, and people have been talking about sourcing GitHub for a long time. So I want to focus on some other things that people might not do or might not have thought of. Um, what I like to do weekly, monthly, whenever I think about it, is look at trending repositories. So repos or, or repositories are projects. Um, and the programming landscape is changing pretty quickly. And I found those who stay on top of it and research new tools are um, better candidates. So in this case, this week's or last week's top um, JavaScript projects are here. Um, you can see how many people starred them, liked them, um, stuff like that. Um, in this case, those are the people um, who starred them, forked them. Um, so I like to go through people who've starred the projects um, just because it shows, um, it shows initiative on their end that they're interested in this stuff. And um, a lot of times you'll find a profile, you might bookmark it, and they might have followers or starred or other starred profiles. So it's just a good way to kind of start a search too, especially if you find somebody in your city. Um, they usually follow others in their city. Um, this next one is also GitHub. So I found recently that a lot of companies are doing coding challenges through GitHub, and they're public. So in this case, it's Tinder, and Tinder has a coding project um, before candidates come on site um, about rebuilding the Tinder app. And um, it's just cool to see how companies interview people. And um, I find candidates prefer smaller projects like this over um, like live coding sessions. Um, but it's also a great way to 
see who is taking their challenges. So here, here are some people who have who've, um, forked the Tinder coding challenge. And you could see their usernames, when they've taken it. So if you line this up with um, like today's date, you can see who is taking the test. And um, if they're interviewing at Tinder, they're probably opening to interviewing elsewhere at the same time. Um, so um, I'm not going to compile a list of all these, but a lot of companies do it. Just go to their company GitHub profiles and um, search through their uh, public repos and see um, who might be taking their test at this time. Um, so that's it with GitHub. Um, another one is iTunes Podcasts. So there's a growing um, there's a growing community of developers who host podcasts and internet radio surrounding development. And one of the biggest communities is something called DevChat.tv. And there's a number of weekly podcasts on uh, Ruby, JavaScript, security, DevOps, and they have guest speakers every week. And um, they're usually um, of who of who guest starred, and and also ratings and reviews. So that kind of circles back to what I was talking about with Goodreads and Amazon, is that there's full names there, there's um, usernames, and it's a great way to generate some people that you might not have found because they might have incomplete LinkedIn profiles. They might, not ha they might not have LinkedIn profiles, but I find people who are listening to this, um, to this type of thing generally pretty, pretty good and like a cut above the um, other candidates. So that's podcasts. So this one is a bit of a, is a joke, um, but I thought it would provide some interesting insight into how I might think and how you, how you could think too. So, um, I have a popular name. There's a lot of people out there who have my name, and there's multiple spellings. So what I did one day, I was bored, and I was doing the more traditional ways. So I wanted to find if there's any other Stephen Woods out there who were programmers. Um, well, I'm not a programmer, but any other, if there were Stephen Woods out there who are software engineers. So I just put in some general keywords. I wasn't going to go crazy here. Um, and believe it or not, there's a ton of Stephen Woods who are programmers. So um, I thought this would be a great way to um, do something more interesting. So in this case, I wrote this other Stephen Woods, well, it's Stephen Woods, but I wrote him an email. I found his email address, um, and I referenced in the subject line that we have the same name. And um, he wasn't interested, but he got back to me and really liked my creativity around the email. So um, it's not something that I would spend a lot of time on, but... Um, it's just another interesting way to um, look at this kind of thing. So that's all I have when it comes to sourcing and candidate discovery. And I guess some of the takeaways and points here is that people and engineers um, are all over. And um, that makes it confusing and hard, but it also makes it more fun on our end. And this is only going to get more confusing over time because these tools keep coming out, these sources keep coming out, and um, we have to get used to this if we're going to remain competitive. Um, and when I mean leverage your resources and use them appropriately, if you find an engineer on one particular source, search elsewhere at the same time. But don't get too personal, um, make, but so make it relevant. And I, I, I also like to keep it short, too, because um, they might not care if you think their dog's cute, um, but if your company is using a tool they're using and they're also um, uh, like working on that or working with that tool on a side project, um, that's that's actually relevant. And also appropriately, as I mean, if somebody is an engineer in Texas and they've been there their entire life, and it looks like. Um, they might have a family through um, social media channels. It might not be the most appropriate candidate to reach out to all the time. So um, these are kind of the um, trade-offs and, um, check, and, and checks and balances I look at when reaching out to candidates. Um, but it still never hurts to um, reach out in the first place. Just do it in a very um, um, uh, appropriate uh, manner. And 
another takeaway from this is um, all of these tactics and and different approaches to finding candidates have has made me a better technical recruiter. I'm forced to read these articles. Um, I'm I'm interested in talking to these people because they have um, a larger presence online. Um, and you really get to kind of stay up to date with what's interesting, what's cool, um, and it pushes you to look in different places. Because um, these are these weren't things that I've learned. Um, these are things that I've kind of discovered through um, just clicking around a lot and typing in different things. And when I'm at a site, or if, it, if it's a site I use for personal purposes, like if I'm reading a news article, sometimes I'll go down the comments and I'll see um, comments and if it's attached to Facebook or Discus, which is a commenting platform, um, and there's a title there, I'm always kind of um, like saving that information, adding it into Greenhouse as a prospect. So um, think of maybe the tools and websites you use on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, and think of how um, you might be able to find your candidates from them. And um, this applies more to just technical re recruitment. Um, if you go back to Goodreads or um, YouTube, there's HR and re recruiting leaders talking um, at conferences, and they're reviewing books about HR and talent acquisition. So um, you can apply this to a number of things. And, and find your niche. So a lot of these might not work for some of you out there. Um, I don't think I've hired somebody off of, of Instagram uh, before, but um, it's just a different way to um, look at this. And um, maybe the type of people you recruit don't have a large online presence. Um, so think of where they might um, where they might be. Maybe it's not online. Maybe it's um, in like magazines or books or newsletters. So um, that's something um, that you have to kind of figure out through trial and error. Um, so another topic I want to talk about is the recruiter phone screen. So um, I've, I've found that a lot people and recruiters um, don't do a great job on one, stocking the company, two, vetting the candidate, and three, um, they might not just they might not be they might not be a great advocate for what they're doing. So like what teams um, work with yours, like how do they co they collaborate? Um, the interview process, and, and that sounds like a, like a no-brainer, but um, it's something you definitely should know. The culture of of your company, um, like what's the work-life balance like? Do people work on side projects? Um, what do people do after work if they do anything together? Um, and that's important to a lot of people, and, and you can kind of target these questions where you might have uh, concerns. So if I'm talking to somebody at a very large company, and it, it becomes um, obvious that they're looking to leave because it's large and they want a smaller environment. Um, kind of harp on those things and, and, and see where the uh, pain points are, but do it very delicately um, because you don't want to um, kind of offend what they've been doing. But um, learn about this. And you can even ask your engineers. It's a great way to start new conversations with them. Um, technology stack, it also sounds like a no-brainer, but people Engineers are generally really impressed when um, I can talk about our stack in depth um, and why we've picked X over Y, um, that the team is looking to move to this. So um, knowing those things gets them excited and also kind of impresses the candidate um, from, a, from a recruiting perspective. Um, cause a, lot, a lot of these calls are very transactional, um, and it, it, it definitely varies based on your company and the candidates that you're looking to hire. Um, and then also why you like working at your company. You should talk about that. Like, what do you like the most? Um, why did you join? Um, people really take that to heart too. Um, and then things you can learn more about. Um, the development process. Do you use Agile, Scrum? Um, who, who defines what's built? Who, um, who does testing? Who does uh, QA? Is the team involved in any open source work? Um, how often is code pushed to uh, to production? Some companies and teams 
do so like once a month. And sometimes that's not attractive to candidates who like to move quickly and get stuff done. So um, look at that. Uh, and then I, I touched upon this before, but how different teams in the company work together. Some people are in an organization where they're very, very um, siloed or they don't get to work with a certain technology. So being able to say that the teams can move around and people work with um, all different types of engineers is usually appealing to um, engineers who prefer smaller and mid-sized companies. Um, another part of this is is what to ask them. So um, you've explained the culture, the team, the company. Um, now it's kind of your responsibility to get a better understanding of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one question I like to ask is how much time do they uh, write, how much of their time is spent writing code? You can learn a lot about uh, a developer based on how much they write code. Um, some companies, they have the, t the title as a developer or engineer, and they're writing code 20, 30% of, of the day. And um, at Squarespace, our engineers are writing code 80% of the day. So it doesn't usually translate and they usually fail on technical interviews because they're not doing it every day and here uh, we expect that. Um, what technologies are they working with? So that's obvious, but um, figuring out their whole stack is also a good sign. Maybe they're using out-of-date technologies and this might be like a question you might want to raise to the engineers before an interview. Like how they, they haven't worked with um, current stuff, they might they might fail on some like newer programming uh, questions, so maybe we should um, give them a break and test potential over uh, experience. How large is your team? Some teams are very large, and and they might um, get lost in that and and not be the best. So, um, kind of asking the team dynamic, in my opinion, is an interesting question. Um, is your manager technical? Some engineers and developers aren't managed by technical people, so. Um, I found asking questions like this can help you learn a bit more about what to expect from them in the interview pr uh, process. And you don't want to ask all every single one of these, just based on the candidate, um, what they know about your company. I'd, I'd say pretty confidently that I probably haven't hired somebody here who wasn't familiar with us at all. And I do talk to those people who apply or I, or I source and they know nothing about us or they glance at our uh, website, like it just doesn't work out. So you can even coach them with having them try the product, research um, the company, um, significant accomplishments, maybe what they've accomplished in the past three to six months. To, does it sound substantial? Um, what are they proud of? And you can, once people start to talk um, and, and um, get excited about their work, that's where I get excited about their candidacy. Um, what they like about their job, what they, um, uh, dislike the most, you can learn a lot from that, and then what would they change? Um, so these are some more insightful questions that I like to bring up with particular um, candidates I speak to on the phone. Um, so that's what I have for the phone screen uh, section. And briefly, I want to go over some tools I use, and I mentioned um, in the beginning that um, these aren't exactly new tools or, or, or things that are um, very um, like awe-inspiring, but they're useful for me, and I'm sure they could be for you as well. So um, Reportive is a tool that sits within Gmail, and it, it'll, on the right side, it'll show you um, a LinkedIn profile, a Twitter profile. Um, I definitely get it. Right Inbox is similar to Boomerang, if you haven't heard of it. It allows you to schedule emails. Um, if you don't get a response after a certain amount of time, it'll have another one sent. Um, MailTrack allows you to track emails. Um, I find that useful because sometimes I reach out to people and they don't get back to me over email because I might have found the wrong one, so I'll follow up on LinkedIn. Um, some people think it's a bit unethical, but um, every newsletter and marketing email you get has this uh, technology built in, so I don't think there's a problem um, applying it to recruiting. Um, Instapaper, I mentioned that it's a tool to save articles that you can view later, and they get saved to your phone, and you don't need internet access. So I find it useful in New York for when I'm on the subway and I want to read things, but also um, if you don't have time to read articles, um, you can create folders and I've created ones for um, recruiting and then I have subfolders for like uh, 
like security, front end, just things I want to stay up to date with. Greenhouse Gmail integration and prospecting. Um, their Chrome extensions and uh, Gmail plugin from uh, Greenhouse allows you to save notes in Gmail and log it into Greenhouse. It's very useful. Greenhouse prospecting allows you add prospects from Chrome. Or um, I don't know. I don't know if there's one for for uh, Firefox or uh, Safari, but um, couldn't really do my job without it. Um, context menu search. I'd suggest you searching that and looking up what it's about, but it allows you to build custom um, um, and recruiting.net. It's a website I found somehow um, that has the ability to x-ray search LinkedIn, GitHub, and a bunch of other tools. Um, it's something you can do manually, but um, it's also a great way to to um, search those um, sources quickly and without having to build the um, searches uh, yourself. But uh, that's all I have. So um, I guess we'll be opening up to Q and A now. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, I know that we have a bunch of questions that are coming in right now. Um, First and foremost, one person in particular uh, is just curious, how did you learn tech? Uh, what specific methods and resources would you recommend for someone with a non-technical background? Steve, are you online? Sorry, it looks like we're experiencing a few technical difficulties. Hang on for a second. Steve, are you back? Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Um, I will repeat the question. Um, for those that are they're really interested in learning kind of where you've adopted all of these skills, so um, how did you learn tech, and what specific methods and resources would you recommend for someone with a non-technical background? Um, where I learned, uh, so I've always come up fairly uh, technical, building my own com computers, playing a lot of um, uh, PC games. But um, I, I think a lot of that, I don't, I don't do a lot of that right now. But I think um, being curious, um, uh, reading about what the people you recruit, what you, the people you recruit for, hire for. Um, being invested in that, asking a lot of questions of your developers. If you um, sit next to them or sit very close to them, um, ask them open-ended questions. If you've seen a new framework come out or a programming language, ask about it. They love to talk about it, and I think one of the best things a recruiter can do is listen in both um, acting as a recruiter when you're speaking with a with a candidate, but also as a partner to your team. Um, and there's some really good books out there and articles 
Um, Bloomberg posted one about what is code. That's a great um, read. And then there's, uh, there's actually a book called Code also. It's for people who are somewhat non-technical, and it explains um, how the Internet came to be and how these different technologies work together. But um, I'm, I've always been fairly interested in um, these topics. Great. Thank you. Um, I know that you've listed a lot of sites for people to learn um, from. Out of all the sites that you've mentioned in the presentation, which ones do you find the most successful when you're a sourcing candidate? Um, most accessible as in like easiest to use and yields the most uh, results? It was a little bit broad. We can start with there, um, and then maybe just in the way that you're finding um, or are communicating um, with these engineers, um, where you're receiving um, more engagement. So maybe both of those those areas. Yeah, sure. So I've had a lot of success using Twitter and GitHub. So what I'll do is I might find an engineer on LinkedIn. Um, that is local to the area I'm recruiting for, and I'll go through their Twitter followers, who they're following, and I'll do the same on uh, GitHub. And if I end up connecting with a, with a candidate, um, regardless of um, if they're interested or not, I'll also go through their LinkedIn connections because a lot of people don't hide the fact that they're available. So um, usually you'll find a lot of people you might not have found through other searches. Um, so I find that a great way. To do things, and again, I'm. I this might not work for everybody, but uh, another good um, thing you can do is like bookmark these. If you've found that there's a lot of uh, potential there, maybe uh, explore that um, like down the road when your uh, when your um, pipeline is shrank, um, because you aren't going to build a huge sourcing pipeline through some of these tools. So I would um, suggest probably most of the time doing what uh, what works best if you send like 100 messages a week, maybe do 60, 70 of them on a, a source that has proven itself and then spend the rest of the time um, doing something a bit more creative. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question coming in. Have you used Stack Overflow and uh, GitHub and what are your thoughts on, on those two platforms? Yeah, I find um, that they're both great. Um, Stack Overflow is great. You can um, actually search. You can search by tags. You can you can uh, remove tags from your search. So I'll search for friend developers, and I'll remove PHP, or I'll remove um, uh, Ruby from my uh, searches, and it'll be um, much more targeted. You can include um, uh, locations, uh, and if you live in a place like New York City, there's a bunch of different ways to spell it, so you can aim those out. Um, so I've had success there. Um, I found out that a lot of those people are aggressively recruited. Some of them are hard to find, so they've made their profiles a bit more anonymous. Um, but GitHub, like I like I showed a few slides ago, as far as like the recruiting. Um, um, like tests that people put on there, the stars, the viewers, um, the, the how you can search through um, followers and and following. Um, there's a, just a bunch of different ways to source GitHub. You can source, um, you can look through projects too. And a lot of the times there's like programming um, projects where people will list a bunch of contributors to a certain project. So um, there's just a number of ways to source from it. Um, but again, I don't think it's um, I wouldn't rely on one or the other more aggressively. Okay, thank you. Um, how much time uh, per day or even per week do you source like this? Do you find more uh, time? Do you find it more time consuming than LinkedIn and Intello, or do you think that they um, are alike? So I think I probably spend most of my time sourcing the more tra the more traditional ways from um, LinkedIn, uh, Greenhouse, looking at old um, applicants who've applied a long time ago, 
um, stuff like that, going through um, referrals. But I'd say I'd probably spend 30 to 40 percent of my time doing stuff like this. And I think there's a lot of uh, noise out there. So there's a lot of profiles that you obviously wouldn't engage because maybe they don't live in your country and, and you can't recruit them. You don't have the, uh, the ability to. But um, you can easily, once you become good at it and, and see what works and what doesn't work, you can be pretty quick at it. And you can know when you're going down a path that might not be um, worth your while. So um, once you find your niche and find like these little pockets of candidates on these uh, various sources, then I think you can be really uh, successful with it. And um, it's a bit more fun, too, in my opinion. So um, that makes it more exciting. Yeah, definitely. Um, in the beginning of the webinar, you were talking about IRC. And we had um, a couple questions on where you find IRC. They were uh, trying to look at IRC.com, um, but where do you actually find that? Yeah, for sure. So IRC is just a technology that one would um, download and they would put it on a uh, server. So there's different um, networks like Freenode. So I would go to Freenode. It's probably the biggest one. Um, there's uh, MIRC or Merck. There's uh, Mibit. Um, these are different networks that have different channels. So some of them might not even have to do with um, programming. There's a key, uh, key will. So um, Freenode is the biggest one. So that list I put on that slide, that's all from Freenode, which is probably the biggest community of um, IRC um, programming topics. And you don't need to create an account. You have to create an, uh, a nickname, which just can't be taken. And um, uh, the channel is there too. You just put a like hashtag Python. You can actually try anything you want. It could be hashtag. You can just make something up, and it might it might actually be there. But again, I, I would suggest not reaching out to people through Slack or IRC because um, you will get banned, and there's potential for them to um, ban you across multiple channels or just your IP address. So um, use it as more of a tool to generate the leads. That makes sense. No, no need to be banned. <laughs> um, lastly, yeah. I know that we're a little over over time, and I just want to thank everyone that's uh, still with us this morning and this afternoon. Um, Steve, more of a fun question. In your bio, you said you were a huge fan of pizza, and uh, a listener wants to know what's your favorite pizza. Oh my God, that's a huge question. Um, I'd say my favorite pizza is the pizza from New Haven, Connecticut. It's from a place called Bar, and it's uh, mashed potato pizza with bacon. So there's no tomato sauce. It's just mashed potato, then cheese, then bacon, um, and you can actually make it at home. I did it a few weeks ago, and it was great, but um, I generally like all pizza. But that's my favorite. That's awesome. We actually have um, one of our coworkers here is from Connecticut, and she just raised her hand, so she totally agrees with you. Um, yeah. I just want to thank you, Steve, and I want to thank Lauren from HackRank, and I want to also thank everyone that have listened in and answered and asked these questions. Um, we will have the recorded version available tomorrow, and thank you so much for joining us in this Hiring Hacks webinar. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And if you have any uh, questions or um, want to pick my brain about anything, you can email me, send me a message on LinkedIn, um, Twitter, whatever. Always happy to help and share secrets. Great. Thank you, Steve.